Uh, okay, well thank you for joining us here. Uh, Rick Yancey has written several adult books and a uh, series and a memoir called Confessions of a Tax Collector. His books have earned honors like the Michael L. Prince Award and have been finalists for the Carnegie Medal and the Los Angeles Times Book Prize. The Fifth Wave is a New York Times bestseller and will be turned into a movie in 2016. <laughs> uh, his new book, The Infinite Sea, it hit the shelves only two days ago, but I've already heard quite a lot of squeeze of delight. Um, and a little synopsis about the book. How do you rid the earth of seven billion humans, rid the humans of their humanity? Surviving the first wave, four waves was impossible. The Infinite Sea, the second book of the fifth wave, finds Cassie Sullivan a new world, a world in which the fundamental trust that binds us all together is gone. As the fifth wave rolls through, the landscape, Cassie, Ben, and Ringer are forced to confront the author's, the other's ultimate goal, the extermination of the human race. Cassie and her friends have the depths of, to which the others will seek, or have the others seen the heights from which humanity will rise, in the ultimate battle between life and death, hope and despair, love and hate. Everyone, Rick Yancey. Thanks. Simply hold the book directly in front of your face. <laughs> I can't get all the. Let me get a run for it. Oh, this is much better. Okay, yeah. Everybody hold it up and say aliens. Aliens! <laughs> Alright, I'm going to keep it close. Alright, press this little button. We're not in the shot. <laughs> there we go. Thank you so much. Working for the cause. Now, just give me about five minutes. I gotta put it on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I'll do that later. So, what's good? You look familiar. Yeah, you're. Is your Katie. name Katie? Yeah, I'm Katie. This is Katie. How do you know me? Twitter? I tweet you all the time. Yes, you're obsessed. I'm the bodyguard. Don't you live in Texas or something? Yeah, I live in Texas. What, do you, what the heck? Well, I love your books. I said, who came a long way? And she's like, I came an hour. You're from Texas? <laughs> so I just was like, oh, okay. What did you do? Did you fly? Yeah, I went drive. Oh, okay. Yeah, that'd be a long way. I've been jet lagged since I got here. I still yeah. feel, I mean, like, feel weird. But that's okay. That's when I'm usually at my best. First of all, what do you think about this cover? Oh, it's awesome. It's so it's cool. It has an owl on it. You're right. Do you see the owl? Yeah. Just like the first cover has an owl, it's the same owl. Only this cover has the owl in the water at the bottom. He's got the first book. Yes, the owl there. Do you see the owl? It's so oh, clever, people oh, miss it. It's a negative yeah. image of an owl. Yeah. It's right there. It's right That's its eyeball. See it now? Got it? 
Everyone see the owl? So now you know. Tell your friends. I found the owl. But the author had to tell me. Okay, who was, who's, what's this? It's mine now. Find out how it is. Okay, the infinite sea. Has anyone read it yet? Don't shout out spoilers, please. Everyone, you know, what has been everyone been dying to know for over a year now? Evan. Is Evan alive? Evan! I'll tell you right now, here's the answer. He just might not be. <laughs> That's your answer. What else? Uh, what, what else news? Um, the book was published on Tuesday. Um, <laughs> you know what I've been meaning to do, and I keep forgetting. I think the next the next bookstore I do, which is tomorrow in Chicago, I'm going to tell them, okay, I want you to wait like five minutes into my presentation, and then I want you to cut out all the lights. <laughs> People wouldn't get it. They'd be just like upset. <laughs> Turn the lights on. But here, if the lights go out, everyone thinks earthquake. Do you guys get a lot of earthquakes? I think about earthquakes when I'm in California. We just had one. We just had one. Yeah, six point two California for a while. Up here, up north. Yeah. Uh, now. Did it wake you up? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, like I live in Florida, where it's very flat, right? And we don't get earthquakes. We get the hurricanes, but we don't get earthquakes, right? And I remember vividly going to this like science museum place, and they had an earthquake room. You know, where they, you can walk into the room, you sit down, and they simulate an earthquake. They shake the whole room. I totally freaked out. I was running out the door. As a, as a, <laughs> never, I mean, it's beautiful here. It's absolutely beautiful, but I don't know if I can just that anxiety. Does the anxiety fade? Yes. It kind of fades into the background, and then it hits, and you ask yourself, why the heck do I live here? No. The whole never. mountain's going to come down on top of me. Never. never. Less than hurricanes. So hurricanes is every year and every yeah, we got plenty of water. If you, I know you have a drought. We'll give you some water. <laughs> plenty of water. And it's so hot. Oh my gosh, it's hot. Now here's why I'm masochistic. I ride outside in Florida, like in August, and it's like 95 degrees, and the humidity's like 98%, and it's like, my wife says, why do you do this? And I said, look, honey, here's what you don't understand. And any of you who are riders understand this. Riders have to be like Marines in the sense that we have to love pain. So think about that. You've got to be a little bit in love with pain. So when my wife says, why do you sit out there at 98 degrees and you're, you're dripping flop sweat trying to write a book, why do you do that? And I said, because I'm a Marine. <laughs> She's like, you're not a Marine. <laughs> I'll be out there when it's like, you know, now cold in Florida is like, I guess it's like cold here, you know, it doesn't get very cold in Florida. Like 30, 38 degrees is like really cold, right? Mm -hmm. So I'll even go outside and sit with a heater, like practically in my lap <laughs> as I'm trying to write. I just can't write with the four walls around me. I don't know what that is. I'm way off topic. What, uh, I, you know, okay, I've gone to author events. I'm sure you have too. I'm not, you know, you're, you know, the only author that you've come to because you're all readers and you all have your favorite authors and they've shown up at this wonderful store and you've come and, maybe not you, but you've come and seen them, you know, so, and I'm sure that, who, who's been to an author event where it was actually kind of painful to sit there? Sound, be honest, yes. The reason we're writers and we're not public speak, you know, <laughs> it's two different skill sets, talking in front of people and writing a book, just totally two different skill sets. So I've been to author events where, you know, the author drones on and on and on. And then maybe they read some of the book and that's even worse than the droning on and on and on. You know, um, so what I like to do is actually have a conversation because I understand, especially at, at a younger age, you know, if I, you know, I loved books at your age too and I wanted to be a writer when I was your age. And if I had been to a, seen an author, a real life author, see, when I was your age, I thought all authors were dead. <laughs> because you never saw them, you know, there was no social media, you know, they didn't get put on TV or anything, they were like these, just the name on the jacket and maybe a picture. So if I were in your shoes and I had, you know, avid reader as well as a writer, then I would, you know, I would want them to shut up 
listen to me for a few minutes and have a conversation. So that's what I'm here to do tonight is have a conversation, not to give you a speech. I might go off tangent because I'm jet lagged. I'm not sure where I am. <laughs> so who's got a question, a comment? Who wants to talk? Don't be shy. No spoilers. Can I ask you a question that's not particularly related to the book, but going off of something you said earlier? So sure, of course. Related, do of you course. write outside in the middle of a hurricane, or how do you, like, umbrella? Yes, I tie myself <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, to a pole. Night, you know, heat, cold, with a space heater. I don't and I'm like this. <laughs> uh, no, if it's really bad. Now, I do like writing in the rainstorm, as long as the thunder's not crashing around me, but usually in Florida, Latecomers will not be seated until intermission. <laughs> I'm kidding. Aren't you sweet? You're too young for this book. How old are you? Um, I'm 12. You're 12? You must love to read. You do? All right, then come up here and you're going to read the first chapter to us. I'm kidding. <laughs> um, you can let me get you a drink. You can have a drink. Because he just made fun of me. Would you like to <laughs> Yes. Can I ask, is the tension in your books because of the hurricanes? Um, no, not because of hurricanes, just because I'm a nervous person. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, we get very bad thunderstorms in, in Florida, and I was hit by lightning once. That might explain a lot. I used to have a job at a cattle ranch, right? And the cattle ranch obviously was surrounded by barbed wire, and this was in the, the swamps of central Florida when I was growing up. And I was working on this fence, and these storms come up really fast. I mean, it's like you feel a breeze against your cheek, and the next thing you know, there's this huge black thing over your head, uh, which some people call a cloud. <laughs> but anyway, he's a writer, he's a professional. Black thing. <laughs> but I happened to be standing right next to the barbed wire when, it, when the lightning hit. It didn't hit me, it hit the fence line, and it, the, the electricity just traveled along the fence line until it got to me, and it knocked me back a couple of feet. And then I had superpowers. <laughs> Another question. What were you doing? Like, where were you when you first came up with the idea for the um, It's you know I, I don't uh, I I come up with images before I do concepts. I come up with images first, where I don't even know who the characters are, why they're in that predicament, what's going on. That goes all the way back to my first book uh, many many years ago, and. For this book, I had this image of a character who was a girl, and she was trapped in this close, tight space, and something was after her. I didn't know what it was, what the peril was exactly, but I knew her dilemma, which was, if I stay where I'm hiding, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get killed. But if I try to get away from this spot, I'm probably gonna get killed. So it was like an either or, and neither, and neither decision had a very good outcome. And that fascinated me, and that turned into the scene of Cassie underneath the Buick, waiting for that silencer to come and finish her off. That was the very first image that appeared that occurred to me. The other thing was was a conversation with my wife when we were. It was like four in the morning. It's one of those weird four in the morning conversations where you know you're really tired and giddy and you're saying stupid things. And and I asked her, uh, "What is your greatest fear?" And she said, "I'm not kidding, aliens." And I'm like, you know, I expected like, you know, cancer or something happening to other kids, maybe something happening to you, dear. <laughs> I used to play this game with my wife. Now, the older people in this room know this game. It's where you become very self-deprecating and you put yourself down so your spouse will, you know, say that reassuring thing you need to hear. So when I first began my career as a writer, I would like, get stuck and I would come in and I would go, oh, no, stupid, 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 stupid. <laughs> My wife would go, no, you're a genius. The world just doesn't know it yet. One day they will. One day they'll recognize you for the great writer and person that you are. Now when I do that, this is what happens. <laughs> Oh, so I, she said aliens, and I said, well, that's not even in my, my top 50, aliens. She said, no, you need to think about this, because we were talking about alien abduction. If an alien abducts you, takes you up to a ship, and does those bizarre experiments on you, right, and then they bring you back, 
Not only have you been experimented on by a terrifying life form, but no one is going to believe you afterwards. And if you try to tell this to somebody, they're just gonna assume you're crazy. And if you insist, they might stick you somewhere because something's the matter with you. So that was a fear of hers. Not just the terror of the experience, but not sharing the community of people supporting her, you know, in, for living through that experience. Which kind of gave me the idea for, you know, the fourth wave, you know, one of the joys of writing this <laughs> joys. Everybody dies. What is wrong? <laughs> one of the joys of writing this series is thinking like an evil alien. Not how we would like aliens to like, treat us, but how they probably would if they had malevolent intent. And that's how the waves came about. And that's how I came up with the idea of the fourth wave, because you know, if if there's no if we to isolate is to destroy, because we're very social creatures, right? I mean, we gather strength by Yes, we are. Talk to me afterwards, okay? <laughs> uh, so that, anyway, I'm, I'm really rambling now. Next. Come on, someone's got something to say. You may never ever see me again. Yes? How much control do you have in the movie? Is it going to be like Christian Jackson? Like, like, well, they've been very nice to me. They've been very nice. Like, um, uh, I asked to see the script. And about you know six months later, <laughs> they sent it to me. And they said, "Oh, we'd love to hear your input." So I called her. I talked to one of the producers, and she said, "Well, just all write it all down for me." So I wrote it all down in a very detailed e email and said, "You know, I have this issue. I have that issue. This is where I think it could be improved. This is where it's really good." And I sent it back to her, and that was like two months ago, and I still haven't really heard anything yet. <laughs> no, it will not be like Percy Jackson. <laughs> No, we're not. Don't do that. They, you know, they got it. When I, when I met with them, the first thing that they said was, this book, this story is about a promise. And I was like, phew. Because that's what the book is about, The Fifth Way. It's about a promise. You know, the aliens are the, the, you know, what's the antagonist to keep casting from her promise. But it's a book about a promise. And it's a book about a teddy bear. <laughs> but talking about the movie, um, I, I am staying in Atlanta now, uh, where they're filming it, and the director took me and he showed me all the storyboards and the um, costume designs and all the locations where they're going to be shooting. About 90% of it's going to be shot right on location. It won't be in a Hollywood set or anything. And uh, the only thing he refused to show me was the teddy bear. And I said, why? And he said, well, because, you know, it's, it's going to be the fifth wave bear. I said, what are you talking about? And here's the idea, is that they're not just going to go to Target or Walmart and grab a bear off a shelf. They're designing the bear from scratch. Why? Ka-ching, ka-ching. <laughs> <laughs> so when the movie comes out, you can go to Walmart or go to Target, and there is Sammy's bear. I don't know what they're going to call it. Fifth Wave Bear, Sammy's Bear. I don't know what they're going to call it. But Obviously, the bear's going to get kind of roughed up in this film, so I, what version are they going to have of the bear? Is it going to be the roughed up, torn up, like dirty, and it's like, the moms will be like, I'm not buying you that. <laughs> That's disgusting. Another question. About anything. Well. What's your favorite character? Oh, that's not asking my favorite child. <laughs> um, I like hanging with Cassie the best because she makes me laugh. And you know, parts of the story get pretty dark. And to have humor in the face of such overwhelming terror and things going on, it, to me, is a great gift that she has. So I love hanging out with her. Ringer's very intense. If, for those of you who haven't read uh, The Infinite Sea yet, uh, Ringer um, uh, steps up in this book. She's not a secondary character. She's one of the narrators and has her own story that happens to her um, that leads on kind of into the third book. Um, Ringer kind of intimidates me, kind of scares me. <laughs> uh, but she is probably one character I'd want by my side if all this was going down, because she has a clear idea of what you got to do if you want to live to the next day. Um, of course, Evan, I won't say if he's alive or dead, but you know, Evan, I think if, you know, it would be okay to hang with Evan, except that if it came between me and Cassie, he would just let me go. Yeah. When, when, uh... You did the fifth wave. Did you envision that there would be more than one book? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I knew it was going to be a very big story. That's how it ended up with more than one narrator. 
because it was so big, it was so kind of epic that I, you know, I realized early on that I couldn't tell it solely from Cassie's point of view, which as a writer, you have to decide then, do I tell the story in third person and use multiple characters, or do I tell the story through multiple narrators using first person, mostly. Um, I chose to do first person with the other characters, like Zombie, um, because it built tension. It, it builds tension for the reader. In the story, it builds tension because there's some things that Zombie knows that Cassie doesn't, and there's something that Cassie knows that Zombie doesn't, but you, the reader, know all of it, and it's very nail-biting. That was the idea, to make you nervous. So you, you mentioned you had kids, right? Mm -hmm. How has having kids affected your writing the story of the fifth way, considering that it primarily focuses on younger Right, well, I, my, my youngest, I consult him about, you know, teen stuff. Like, uh, there was, um, I, I remember he was upstairs and I was outside and I started texting him. I said, I need a phrase that means this person's really good at what they do. And when like two seconds you were back, their boss. And like, <laughs> yes. And it ends up in the fifth wave. I use that expression in the fifth wave. Um, I don't, uh, give manuscripts to my kids to say, give me your notes, but they, they always are willing to, to, to do that. <laughs> um, do you ever, like, write, when you're writing, you want it, the story to go a certain way, but then when you're writing it, like, the characters won't do what you want them to do? <laughs> All the time. Okay, so it's not just me. No, I hate your guts. Okay. <laughs> Jerks. I need validation that I'm not the only one. Yes, that's always a very good sign. That's always a very good sign. Um, you know, I don't want to get too, you know, but um, you know, the Greeks believed that stories exist for all eternity. I mean, they've existed since the beginning, since before the beginning. And the artist, the writer, the poet, the dancer, whoever, um, is just channeling or becoming the conduit for that to come into the world. Um, I always, I've had this feeling, and the, the writers in here, I hope you've had it too, um, where you feel like you're just, it's almost like an out-of-body experience because you're just floating with it and it's just flowing out. I mean, and the characters are saying what they say and they're doing what they do and you're just kind of like just recording it for them. It's kind of a weird experience. Very weird. Unique to that. When I'm reading your book, I can't stop. And I think there's probably a lot of writers who wish they could write like that. Yeah. And so I'm wondering, how did you learn about pacing? Or I mean, is there... How did you I think it helps as a writer in this kind of story, of, a, of, of this kind of story, I think it helps as a writer to have a very low boredom threshold. <laughs> Where, you know, if you're starting to feel bored in your manuscript, you probably can pretty much guarantee a reader is going to start feeling bored at that point, too. Um, I don't think that's unique to me. I think a lot of writers are probably like that. Um, for me, going into writing was like the reason Einstein went into science. I just found everyday life so incredibly dull. And living, you know, living through these stories or, or writing these stories, you know, like, uh, it's just, it sort of ramps up your, your feeling of being alive. Because you are, I mean, it's like that, uh, uh, that saying I see flying around the internet all the time is, you know, a reader li lives a thousand lives. And that's the same is true for a writer. You know, it, I mean, sometimes it's very uncomfortable to be inside another person's skin in their head, and sometimes it's just a, a wonderful experience, you know. Um, did you see, like, the, the people who were playing your kids? Yes, I did. Yeah, I did. Did they look like how you wanted them? Uh, I'm glad you brought that up. This came up last night, too. This is, inter this is an interesting phenomenon. Okay, um, what makes book, one of the things, just one, that makes books different from movies is, Movies just, you know, they spoon feed you, right? The character looks like what they look like because that's what the character looks like. They're up there, you know, 10 feet high in front of you. For a reader, though, I, I don't know of any writer, maybe someone could tell me of one that does this, I don't know of any writer who describes, for example, a character down to their last eyelash. And in that sense, we all have our own Cassie Sullivan. You have your Cassie, I have my Cassie. You have your Cassie, and, and none of them are exactly alike. You know, we, we paint sometimes the pictures in, you know, for the characters in broad brush strokes, but we don't, we don't hand it all to you. And that's what's so wonderful about reading is that it becomes a deeply personal experience where you do share Cassie with me, but it's your Cassie that you're sharing. So when I saw the people, at first there was a disconnect. 
because Chloe Grace Moretz doesn't look exactly like the Cassie that's in my head. But after a few minutes of you know talking and interacting and hearing her read sound, it was like, okay, there's Cassie. But that doesn't mean you have to abandon the Cassie in your head for Chloe Grace Moretz. Like, oh, now I have to read this picture of Chloe. You know, that's just one director's or casting director's vision of, of, of the character. It doesn't have to be yours. Another question. How many books is it going to be? I heard it was going to be a trilogy. Is it each going to be a trilogy? Well, you know, not my agent has his way. <laughs> The series is doing very well, so we're thinking, you know what? If it has to be a fourth book, that'd be really good. You know. You know, but only if you think so. <laughs> only if you think so. Now, of course, if your manuscript gets really, really long, and it's possible maybe to split that last book into two books. <laughs> but right now, the, the intention is to do a trilogy. It depends on the book. Um, this book, actually, I'll tell you a little, I'll tell you a secret. A secret? I'll tell you a secret. I don't think I've told anyone this yet. But I think it's important for a writer to talk about their failures as well as their successes, particularly for young writers. This is the second Infinite Sea book. I wrote an entire manuscript and my editor rejected it. She was very sweet about it. It wasn't like she called me on the phone and said, This is garbage! <laughs> you call yourself a professional? You're in big trouble, buddy. Didn't exactly happen that way, but I got the message. So after feeling sorry for myself and throwing a few things and you know trying to drown my dog, no, I did, oh my did not do that. <laughs> love my dog. If you follow me, you know I love my dog. Um, I sat down and wrote an entirely new manuscript, and they really loved it. And so that's what this is. But just because you know you've done this, I've done this for 15 years now, doesn't mean that you still got a couple of failures in you. And I see now the wisdom of them rejecting the manuscript. I really do. Um, it's tough sometimes to pick yourself up after that, because that first version took about 10 months, and then I had to get the next version out in about six. But some elements of the first manuscript got back in, you know. It did turn out to be a much better story, I thought, than what I had before. Now someone is going to ask me, well, what was that one? What happened to that one? Why was it so bad? Was you just kill everybody off? <laughs> so just to follow on to that, how, how long did it take to soon into the process do you have to think about what the third book would be like? I'm thinking that as I'm writing. You know, I know how everything ends. I know how... I know what happens at the end of the third book. I know who lives, I know who might not live. I know if we win or lose. I know the ultimate fate of us and the ultimate fate of the others. I know all that. How to get all to that spot, that's, that's part of the joy of the journey. Yeah, finding that line. I don't know, but I want to make sure you remind me about that Twitter contest. Yes, okay, there's a very exciting contest sponsored by Sony Pictures. And here it is. Take a selfie of you. Of course, that is a selfie, that's self defined. <laughs> Take a selfie of your mother. <laughs> Take a selfie holding the two books, both books. Fifth Wave and the Infinite Sea. Send it to hashtag the something something <laughs> Fifth Wave Movie Contest or something like that. If you start searching, you'll find this. Um, there is an official movie Twitter account. Search for that, and it's the, all the rules and everything are on that. You post that that selfie. Um, I think the social media they do it on is uh, Facebook and Twitter. I'm not sure about Instagram. You might want to check, um, and you can win. A day on the set for the filming of the fifth wave. <laughs> so make sure you do it. Wait, who's my chances if you were in the selfie library? Somebody asked me that last <laughs> night, and they actually did that, but technically it wasn't a selfie because mom took the picture. Uh, no, I'll do something. So it has to be I'll a selfie. selfie but yeah, so, yes, afterwards, if we have some time, yes, I'd be happy to. But that doesn't guarantee you anything. Don't take it, you know, don't get all upset if I don't. <laughs> doesn't get you the, the, the big win. Another question. So I'm curious, 
So there's kind of this huge trend of very bleak, either apocalyptic or post-apocalyptic or dystopian visions of the future. Yes. Why do you think there aren't more books coming out with more optimistic visions of what the future looks like? I think, you want some personal theories? Or just ask something you kind of you know, contributed to that trend of a, you know. Oh yeah, it's all my fault, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Here, while I'm here, I, have, I do have a couple of theories. Obviously, I've thought about that, and I do have a couple of theories about it. I think, particularly, the generation or two before us um, worried about the bomb. You know, they worried about the bomb. I remember um, uh, bomb shelters. I remember um, nuclear drills where we were told to get underneath our desk in case of a nuclear attack. <laughs> I remember videos they would show in school of, if you're outside when a nuclear attack happens, dive into a ditch. <laughs> remember that? Yeah. That's true. You guys have grown up in the post 9-11 generation, which caused a great deal of uncertainty, right? We've been at war since 9-11, 2001. We have been in a continuous, never-ending war. The names of the countries change, right? But the war goes on. And it, there is no end in sight. A lot of uncertainty. You know, when, when somebody can, gets an idea to use an airliner as a bomb, I mean, we're in very weird, uncertain times. And I think dystopians and apocalyptic books play into this generalized anxiety about that. This sort of existential question, you know. You know, and by the way, the, the, you have a better chance of getting hit by lightning than being killed in a terrorist attack, but that really doesn't really matter, right? The anxiety exists. My other theory about that is, has to do with you guys and the age that you're at. I'm not so old, well I might be that old, but I'm not so old, I don't remember my transition out of high school into the wider world. And there was an apocalyptic sense to it. Because when you think about it, everything is ending. You're no longer you're, you're, you know, under the, the, however you want to put it or think about it, the control or guidance <laughs> of your parents, right? You're going, whether you're going out to college or in the workforce, wherever you're doing after you leave high school, you know, the, the, the whole world's changing. Everything changes and almost in an instant, right? It's very, it's probably the one um, time in your life where it is so abrupt, just in a matter of weeks, you know, bam, everything changes. Um, and that's another theory I have, that um, apocalyptic dystopian stuff appeals to a certain age group. Um, and it doesn't hurt because, you know, if you throw in a hot guy or two or some sort of love interest, or, you know, <laughs> something has to do with that. That doesn't hurt. Because that's too part of growing up and feeling your way, and, you know. Although I doubt, you know, that in the real world, love triangles are so prevalent. You know? <laughs> Another question. That's a great question. Very philosophical. Did you have to do well? Why did you choose Ohio as the setting of the fifth wave? Because the nature of the waves themselves. Mm -hmm. I needed some place inland, mm -hmm. right? If Cassie was growing up, you know, here. She would die. <laughs> it would be over. It would be over. You know? Right? So she, she needs to be in the middle of the country that would be immune from, or semi-immune from, the... Uh, and, and that's also where everyone would start to, phew, after the second wave hit, phew, they'd get away from the water and all the devastation along the coasts. So it was a good spot to set the story in. Did you spend any time up there? To Oh, I've been through Ohio several times, but most of it was, you know, thank God, thank goodness for uh, Google Earth, you know. <laughs> Use a lot of Google Earth. Yeah, they talk about some caverns a lot in this, and these are actual caverns that they talk about, you know, heading off to. When the story opens, they're in a um, hotel. It's a prearranged spot. Evan made this agreement with Cassie. He said, he told her before they went into uh, Camp Haven, he, told, he tells her, if you find Sam and you're able to get out, meet me here. And that's where they are when the book opens. They're, you know, waiting for Evan. See if he shows up. Does he show up? <laughs> Another question. Leah killed all characters are like, and then he magically died. Oh, am I malicious about it? No, I bawl. 
I ball like a baby. Um, I finished a series called The Monstromologist, and uh, that last book had me, I was just an emotional basket case. You know, both characters at the end of that don't come to a good end, and it was like very hard for me. It was very hard. They become like, you know, after four books, they become, you know, become very close to them. Um, when I reached a certain scene, you'll probably identify the scene when you're reading this book in The Infinite Sea, I cry. I'm very emotional when I write. I laugh, I cry. It's weird because I got earbuds in, right? <laughs> I've got the music blaring in my ears. I'm just sobbing like a baby, so all my family hears is, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, he's writing again. <laughs> Ritual that you get yourself to write and you just don't feel like writing. Yes. I, need to. I wait. I wait till about uh, the end of the month, and then I go to my mailbox and I get the, my mortgage statement. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I gotta write something. I gotta write something now. <laughs> you touched on, on something that we talk about at our house a lot, and that is. Can you really concentrate if you've got music blaring in your ears on your writing? It depends on the music. Uh, I listen to movie soundtracks. Movie soundtracks? Yes. Yes! <laughs> yes! Yeah. I listen to movie soundtracks. Um, i tell you some great ones if you're writing action adventure. Um, the score to Gladiator, also one of the best action movies ever made. <laughs> a serious man crush on Russell Crowe. <laughs> when I heard that Marin County, a lot of celebrities come to book passages, I thought, I wonder if Russell Crowe is still allowed in this country. <laughs> <laughs> and he might be stopping by book passages tonight. Um, Gladiator's a good one. Um, the soundtrack to the movie Speed. Uh, a Hans Zimmer soundtrack. All oh, these are Hans Zimmer, I guess. But uh, to... Um, uh, 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 King Arthur, a movie that came out a long time ago. Um, I do have got, I have gotten hooked on, and I got hooked on like in the last, in, in, in Ringer section of the Infinite Sea, on Imagine Dragons. I don't know how that happened, but I discovered this song, Radioactive, and I'm telling you, the thing about it is that like, with words, it's usually dangerous for me because I'll be writing and I'll start singing because I like to impress myself with my own genius. Look at me, I'm able to sing and write at the same time. That is genius. Um, but if you listen, <laughs> you want to write that down. Um, but I would listen to Radioactive so many times that you know I just stopped singing the words because then you stop they, the words kind of fade into the background, you know, and then it's just that drum beat that just you know in your head. I've gotten to the point now where it's almost impossible for me to write without music in my ears because if I don't have the music, then every little tiny sound like distracts me. My dog belches and I just jump, you know. <laughs> he belches a lot. Okay, when this dog was a puppy, I brought him into the vet. And she said, oh, isn't he adorable? I said, how big is he going to get? She said, oh, about 75 pounds. I said, my last dog was like 10. <laughs> she said, does he belch a lot? <laughs> I said, I haven't noticed that. She said, he will. <laughs> but boy, does he. Max, he's a, I'm just going to pull up his picture. He's a, um, he's a golden doodle. He's a golden retriever and a poodle. Golden Doodle. It's either the smartest dog I've ever lived or the most idiotic. You can't figure it out. You didn't realize we got him in Tennessee and then moved back to Florida and he didn't realize what a pool was. So he saw me on the other side of the pool and he just ran straight towards me. <laughs> My son Jake freaked out. You know, so he dives in the pool, he's got his cell phone and his wallet, he doesn't care. He dives right in the pool to rescue the puppy. Oh. I said, Jake, that's how dogs learn to swim. Yeah. Just let him swim. Now he loves to swim. He swims all the time. But he's an angry swimmer. He's angry when he swims. He does. And if we're in the pool with him and he's swimming, he starts growling at us. <laughs> Another question. Do you have chips for young writers? Chips? No, I don't have any chips. <laughs> uh, going to college and getting an English degree is great. You don't have to, to become a great writer. There's only one thing you need to be, two things you need to be a great writer, right? One is you have to be alive. 
<laughs> and you have to be at least over four years old. Pearl Buck said, all you need to know emotionally to be a good writer, you have learned by the time you're four years old. Think about that. By the time you're four years old, you've experienced love, hate, rage, fear, comfort, distress, hunger, thirst, everything that encompasses the human emotional experience you have already lived through by the time you're four years old. The other thing I would advise you to do is not just write, you know? Don't find a lonely garage someplace and lock yourself in and think you can produce anything that anyone's going to want to read, right? Part of the, the you look familiar too, young man. Yes, have we met? I keep glancing your way and thinking, I know that guy. Do, are you sure we haven't met? I don't believe you. <laughs> but in terms of learning your craft, the only way that I was able to do it was just writing a lot. Because with each thing you write, you learn something about the craft. And you learn your strengths and you learn your weaknesses. Um, read writing that you enjoy. Don't force yourself. You know, if you're not into the Russian 19th century writers like Dostoevsky and Tolstoy, don't force yourself to read it. You know, don't put yourself through that. You know, I would never tell someone, I would never put my nose in the air and say, don't read Twilight. It's horrible, it's garbage. I would never do that. You know, if that Twilight's your thing, read Twilight. Um, will you learn a lot about writing by reading Twilight? Next question. <laughs> Develop your characters or, and or the plot? Like, did you just see it, or was it like you had to sit down and basically visualize that you're having conversations? Um, I, it's all visual with me. Well, and hearing too, but I mean, hearing your voices in my head. I mean, uh, it's all visual. That's how I think. Um, I, uh, I'm always, uh, um, I think I, one of the gifts I have as a writer is I have a good ear. You know, when something doesn't just sound right, you know, and if I have a question about something, here's another good tip for uh, beginning writers. Read your stuff aloud, no matter how uncomfortable it makes you. If it makes you super uncomfortable, you know, wait till no one's in the house, close yourself off in your room, you know, crawl under your bed, whatever you need to do, you know, so if, if you're concerned about that, and read your stuff aloud. You will be shocked. You really will be, how, how that will help you rewrite, how that will help you edit, how that will help you develop your own unique voice because that's what's unique to you, right? That's something no one else has, is your voice. And that's a great way to uh, get it. And when I get stuck, I still do that. I will stop everything and I'll start reading it aloud. I've been told that we have to let the author go home to bed soon, so one more question. Yeah, I can talk all night, I guess. I've got <laughs> stuff to do. Oh, I have um, Did any other like books or like pieces of things that you written of like uh, Fred, did that influence this? Like did you find yourself writing character and be like, wait, that kind of sounds like something I've heard before? No, I never I I never had that kind of feeling or experience. I, I do think that, you know, if you read widely what you should do, that um T. S. Eliot had a quote about this. Something about if you know um, don't try to emulate anyone. But you know, if, if something comes out, it's it's a, it's a, it's an echo, not a plagiarism. You know, it's not you know you're stealing. Um, obviously, we're affected by everything, everything we read, everything we experience, and some of those things do bubble up. You know, I have you know, if my kid says something hilarious, I'm not above stealing what he said and putting it in a book. You know, or an experience from my own childhood or, or whatever. You know, I'm sure some of the terrors of my childhood have ended up in my books. My brother, um, I just want to, my brother <laughs> choked me to the point where I passed out once. Yeah, isn't that shocking? See, this is why I love to come to book events. I don't have a shrink. I just come and talk to you guys. <laughs> it's cheaper, right? I benefit. Uh, and so he was afraid that the babysitter would find me, so he put me in a closet. <laughs> that man is a judge now. <laughs> I'm not kidding. He's a judge. Think about that and be afraid. 
Thank you guys so much. I will sign up.